there, Samson. About half of us, that's good. I'll give you an overview of it in a second. But I want to start off by saying that I was raised in the church, and I was always taught to think of the main character in our story for today as a kind of impulsive, self-centered, morally reprehensible type of person whose undoing was the result of a long list of really bad choices. And I can certainly see how one would gather that lesson from this story, but over the past few years of my life, reading through this story many, many more times, it's one of my favorite stories in the Bible, I've begun to see some things in it that I never saw before that kind of leap off the page at me. And scripture is kind of interesting like that. We go through experiences in our lives, or we come up with questions, or we uh, bump into problems, and we see what we need to see in Scripture when we're ready to see it. So to give you an overview of the story, and I'll try to go through this as quickly as I can, the story of Samson is found in the book of Judges in the Old Testament, and Samson is kind of like a, a biblical Hercules. He's a man of superhuman strength, much like myself. <laughs> And the story goes that the secret of Samson's superhuman strength is found in the length of his hair. Also like myself. <laughs> so he's never had a haircut in his entire life. But the story recounts some of these amazing exploits. He gets attacked by a lion in one chapter, and he wrestles the lion to the ground, and he kills it. He fights off 30 Philistine men in a fight all by himself, and if that's not enough, this is like some Iron Age Jason Bourne type stuff. He gets captured and he escapes an entire army of Philistines and he kills them with the jawbone of a donkey. The jawbone is not attached to the donkey when he kills them with it either. <laughs> but he eventually, he rises up the ranks in his culture and he becomes a political and a military leader in ancient Israel and he falls in love with this woman named Delilah. However, He's unaware that he's being set up by the Philistines in doing so. They've bribed Delilah with a bunch of silver, and they want her to find out what the real reason is for Samson's human, superhuman strength, because they want to do away with him once and for all. He's their greatest enemy. So Samson begins a relationship with Delilah, and each time they're together, she asks him what the secret of his strength is, and he lies to her each time. One time he tells her he needs to be tied with bowstrings. Another time he says he needs to be tied with ropes. Another time he says that his hair needs to be woven into a loom. And Delilah starts to lay on the guilt when she finds out that he lied. And she asks him, why won't you tell me what the secret is? Don't you love me? Why do you keep lying to me? And Samson finally gives in. And he tells her the truth, and he says, if you shave my head with a razor, I'll become like anyone else. My strength will become like any other man. And so that evening, Samson falls asleep in Delilah's lap, and while he's asleep, she shaves his head, and the Philistines enter, and they capture him, and they gouge out his eyes, and they put him in prison, and they make him do manual labor, grinding grain in the dungeon. He's alone. He's blind. He is weak. But in these long days in the dungeon, Samson's hair begins to grow back. So one evening, the Philistines are throwing this giant celebration in their temple, the Temple of Dagon, their god. And all of the military leaders and all the government officials and all the people of note are there. The Bible says that 3,000 people were there. And they're celebrating because they finally captured Samson and subdued him and found out how to keep him from destroying their armies. And so they bring up Samson out of the dungeon and they start to mock him. And as Samson's standing there shackled between these two pillars that are supporting this giant temple, he leans over to one of the servant boys that's walking him around and he says, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I can lean against them. And the servant boy does as he's asked, and Samson stands between these two pillars of the temple, and he prays this prayer quietly to himself. He says, Sovereign Lord, remember me 
Please, God, strengthen me just once more, and let me, with one blow, get revenge on the Philistines. And so he braces himself between these two pillars, and he pushes with all of his might, and the pillars collapse, and the temple comes down, and it kills everybody. Close the curtain, kill the lights, last call for the bar in the lobby, and the show. <laughs> Now, as I look back over my experiences and the things that now stand out to me in this story that didn't before, I see some things that are really helpful to me, maybe even therapeutic for me in my life. I see a pattern in the story now having gone through some experiences that I never saw in it before. The pattern that I see woven throughout this story, and as cheesy as this might sound, it's just what leaps off the page at me. Though Samson is a person of power and status and position and prestige, I can see that the story starts off by setting up this context wherein he has no one to love and he has no one to be loved by. The story starts off by saying that Samson hires a, uh, a woman of the night and he fellowships with her. And then just a few sentences later, it says that he falls in love with Delilah. And if it wasn't love for Samson, if he was just looking for something physical in his life, he'd have just continued doing what he was doing. But it says he falls in love with Delilah. And for Samson, if you read through this story carefully, especially in those opening paragraphs, you see that what he's going through has all the marks of love. He and Delilah are intimate. They spend a lot of time together. He shares his deepest secrets with her, secrets that if she told someone else, could destroy him. And this story that for a majority of my life I thought was about nothing more than the results of living an impulsive, morally bankrupt life, is in fact more a story about a man who gives himself fully to someone who betrays him. And that's why all of the bad stuff happens. In other words, Samson's behavior in his life, behaviors that were by no means an example of godliness, I'm not excusing that, but those behaviors were not the reason for his tragedy. The reason for his tragedy was wanting love so badly that he became not just physically blind, but emotionally blind, unable to see that this person whom he loved and who he thought he could trust was just someone trying to take advantage of it. And so Samson, physically, is a strong man. He's able to carry any weight that's placed on him. But suddenly in this story, emotionally, he's unable to carry the weight of this betrayal. And maybe, just maybe, it didn't have anything to do with the length of his hair. Maybe when he woke up and he found out that Delilah had cut all of his hair off in that moment, he realized, ah, I told her my deepest secrets. I told her how she could really harm me, and she did. She betrayed me. This wasn't love after all. And maybe in realizing that, that's what made Maybe you don't agree, maybe you like the strength in the hair thing, but can we just be pragmatic here for a second without invoking magical thinking or something? What's more likely? That Samson's strength really came from his hair? Or that he was weakened because he was betrayed by someone that he loved? Anyone ever been there before in your life? I certainly have. I don't know that there's anything more painful in human existence than being betrayed by someone that you love. 
I don't know that there's anything more emotionally emaciating and taxing than giving yourself fully to someone than finding out that they have different intentions all along. And you might be sitting in your seat this morning thinking, Ryan, please, for the love of God, don't make me think about all this stuff in church. I came here to be happier. I came here to find peace. And I understand that. But on the other hand, I would respond gently and pastorally. Wounds that are only covered up are actually never healed. Wounds need to be brought out into the light and acknowledged for what they are so that they can be disinfected and sutured so that healing can take place. And having been there and in a lot of ways still there in my life, I know in my gut how betrayal feels. I know what it's like to go through long seasons where you can't fall asleep and then when you finally fall asleep you have trouble waking up and you just scattered and unable to find your center, unable to focus. When we place our trust in someone and that trust is used only to hurt us in the end, it's like it can throw the entire world off its axis. We might feel weak or blind or alone. We might begin to question the motives of everyone in our lives. We might start looking at our closest friends through the eyes of a skeptic, ever hesitant to trust anyone again. We go through these times, metaphorically speaking, in dungeons, going about our work that may feel more like manual labor than a career or a calm. But over time, very slowly, our strength returns. Our sight returns not to our physical eyes, but to the eyes of our heart. We learn to start living not just by what we see with our physical eyes, but by discernment from the heart. I pray this prayer that Samson prayed verbatim, except for the part of killing the Philistines. I don't want to kill any Philistines, but I, I pray this prayer all the time in my life. Sovereign Lord, or sovereign just means all-knowing. All-knowing Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. I pray that prayer a lot when the memories that are traumatic for me begin to flood my mind and I start to feel weak. When we've been through trauma, it's often hard to pray at all, and it's even harder to pray about the future. And so I pray this prayer for God to just give me the strength for today, just for one more day. Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. I don't ask God to strengthen me three or four or ten more times, but just once more. And something about that helps me. My question for us today, which you might not want to think about in church, but they're questions we need to ask ourselves. Who hurt you? Who betrayed your trust? Who did you give yourself fully to only to find out that the whole thing was rigged or became rigged over time? How do you do things differently next time without becoming the very kind of person who betrayed you? All I know that is in my own life, every day I have the choice to take the low road and just assume that everybody's corrupt and everybody's out for their own and never give anyone else in my life a chance. Or I can take what I've learned in the dungeons, if you will, of my life and use that knowledge and use that experience to inform how and who I trust in the future. And like Samson, even at the very height of our humiliation, 
and our brokenness, there's always someone there standing beside us to help us find the pillars so that we can lean on them and do what we were once able to do before all the trauma happened. Who keeps calling you? Who keeps texting you? Who never gives up on you even if you give up on yourself? Who listens to you and not just like, you know, just giving you ear service, but who really listens to you when you talk about your pain? Who is more concerned about you as a person than they are about what they can get by being connected to you? Lean into those people in your life. People who take your hands and guide you to the pillars at the very height of your trauma. I, uh, this morning I, I park in this garage over there somewhere. Wait, it's over there somewhere. I park in this garage weekly. And um, Sunday morning the garage is usually very calm. And as I was going to get my car this morning, I don't have one of those backup cams on my car. I'm, I'm, I'm better than that. Uh, <laughs> but this couple was coming into the garage and they had this beautiful big giant vehicle and he you know, wanted this certain spot and I didn't think he was going to fit in there. And he's backing in and I could tell I was watching him because I'm thinking this guy's going to hit that car. And he's, I could see him looking in his backup cam and then I could see his partner looking backwards and like saying, go this way, go that way. And I got to thinking about how that has so much to do with trust. I've rented cars sometimes that have backup cams and I don't, I don't trust the backup camera. I prefer to turn around and look because I don't think it's actually giving me a good representation of what's behind the car. And that's kind of how it is when you've been betrayed by somebody. You don't want to use the backup cam. You start to think of the backup cam as a thing that's going to hurt you. And so you take it all on yourself, you choose to do it yourself, and then as we've often probably experienced, the backup cam was right and we bump into something or we dent the car and there's pain. Mostly financial pain. <laughs> but I was thinking about that this morning and um, thinking about my life and my propensity to just take my trauma and my hurt and whenever I make a new friend or form a new business partnership or connect with someone new in my life, what I often want to do is take that trauma and just put it over top of this new person and say, well, they're probably just like everybody else, so I'm gonna label them with this trauma to keep myself from getting hurt. And that's actually what perpetuates pain in life. Because we're prejudging someone instead of giving them the dignity and the opportunity to be who they really are. And there's always a chance you're going to get hurt. The only way to not be hurt in life is to move into a bunker in the woods. But we've been given second chances and other people deserve second chances. And the, the most important thing is that we not take what we've been through and then label everyone else in the world. We can learn from our experiences without becoming judgmental people when we've been betrayed. Let's pray. God, I like the lighter, easier, happier things. 
And yet when we look into scripture more often than not, we find that it's filled with stories of disappointment, and pain, broken relationships, infighting in families. Those stories are there for a reason because you know that that's what we deal with. I pray this morning for everyone in this room who feels a spike of anxiety or stress or depression when they think of a person that has betrayed them in their lives. God, I pray that you would give us courage, that you would, I, I don't even know how to ask it, but that you would just help us to move on, to acknowledge the past for what it is, but not to let our past dictate our future. Give us courage to trust again and again and again. Help us to see the people that are arriving in our lives. Help us to lean into the people that are here in our lives instead of always thinking of those that are on their way out.